Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Labib. I'm a principal architect here at AWS. I'm excited to be uh, speaking with you about Amazon Quantum Ledger Database, so for short, Amazon QLDB. As some of you may know, this is a, a service that's in preview. Um, and so uh, you know, if you're looking in the console, you don't see it there. It's because of that. Um, there's actually a link. If you want to be whitelisted, you can fill out that link. You can submit uh, if it catches your interest. Um, but because it's also in preview, I'm not going to be taking any uh, you know, back and forth questions. But if you have questions for me at the end, please you know, come by, grab me, and we'll take it from there. So with that said, you know, kind of to take a step back and looking at the portfolio of database and analytics services, Amazon QLDB is uh, technically a database service, but it has a lot in common with blockchain technology, right? And so from a, uh, from a uh, complete history and immutable, uh, the ability to have immutable um, transactions and, uh, you know, a ledger uh, and a journal, um, that all exists with uh, Amazon QLDB. The difference here, though, is that there is a central authority, right? And so with QLDB also, you also have a, a SQL interface to interact with it. And it has a lot of database characteristics. It's, it's actually a database, right? So we'll kind of dive a little bit more into that and talk about QLDB and why we built QLDB as we kind of go through the presentation. And if we take another step back and we think about the different database services that we have at uh, AWS, we have a lot of, we have a large collection of purpose-built databases. And uh, you know, if you know how we sort of, the way we think about databases, we built purpose-built databases because they're optimized for a particular use case and a particular um, problem, right? And so when we uh, zero in on a ledger database, um, the Ledger database essentially allows you to build system of record applications. So what is a system of record application? A system of app uh, record application would give you the ability to have a complete history, an immutable history that you can verify and you know it's never been changed, right? So all those transactions that take place in that database are there, right? And so you have some cryptographic capability uh, where you know it's it's all there, it's complete, and it's unchanged and unmodified. And so, you know, when we think about that and we think about record keeping and we think about transactions, um, you know, a lot of different verticals obviously are storing transactions and doing record keeping. And record keeping in itself is a huge conversation. I mean, it goes back to ancient times, right? There's always been various forms of record keeping. Uh, but, you know, just kind of thinking through, you know, as we sort of dive into this, if we look at, for example, banking and finance, right? And so what would be a complete history of transactions? It might be all the debits and credits associated to an account. It might be the entire process involved with a loan, right? Applying for a loan. You want to know exactly what took place uh, for a particular account, for a particular user. Um, for e-com, transfer and logistics uh, could be the entire history of where something is in a particular process, where that order is, what the inventory looks like, um, what transactions, what activity occurred during that uh, state, and then knowing that none of this thing uh, was changed or altered or modified. HR and payroll, obviously, could be uh, you know um, paychecks. It could be personal information related to employees. To be able to know um, this is the sequence of events that occurred with a particular employee, and then knowing that um, again this has never been changed, it's never been modified, and and having a a complete history of the events that took place, right, and so on and so forth. So one of the other ones that we're going to talk about is we'll kind of brainstorm what a, a DMV. A scenario might be uh, as we think about government uh, tracking, uh, in this case, uh, vehicle uh, title history. And so, you know, some of you may be thinking, well, you know, what's the problem, right? I'm, I've been doing this with traditional databases for some time, and uh, you know, you may be have you've may have been solving some of these problems using audit tables, maybe transaction logs, and. Um, audit trails, various different ways that you can sort of solve this, right? And so um, what it boils down to, though, is those aren't native solutions, right? Those things can be very resource intensive. So if you think about, for example, an audit table, a lot of these audit tables are massive in terms of size, and they're very resource intensive on your database, right? So that's additional compute. 
and memory uh, just for audit. The other thing is that you know, some of these processes might be difficult to scale, right? You might have to build these tables and coordinate um, you know, maybe procedures, store procedures, and different things that you need to do to make sure the data is reflected in both you know, the current tables, the audit tables, et cetera, right? And then from, a, you know, from the incomplete or the verifiable standpoint, at the end of the day, you know, like, you know, who can prevent somebody with root access or system access, right, to being able to modify some of these tables that we're actually using for controls, right? I mean, obviously, you can set up user access and things like that, but you don't have any cryptographic capability to say, indeed, nothing here has ever been altered, right? There's nothing like that. And so what we're basically saying here is that we've been solving this problem, but not in a very native way, right? And so what this database, uh, uh, what this capability, what this need is, is really allowing you or providing an, a, a capability to solve this in a more native way. And so some of you might also be thinking, well, what about blockchain, right? So blockchain is a very interesting technology. Blockchain allows you to have the complete history of transactions. It's also immutable. Um, but there is a slightly different use case, right? So the use case here that we're describing is a centralized authority, where blockchain is really built for decentralized uh, transactions. So with blockchain, you might have a, a group, a collection of uh, groups who are all participating in the consensus and the transactions and making sure that these transactions are, um, you know, they're all owning the data, essentially, right? And so with uh, a centralized um, authority, you basically have one repository, one owner, right, one database. And it's that one owner who is responsible for those transactions. So if you're thinking back to the HR and payroll uh, scenario, that might be your personal organization's uh, HR system, right? That's not something you want to uh, participate in a, uh, you know, maybe a, a larger blockchain uh, environment. And so again, that sort of lays some background uh, foundation in terms of what Amazon QLDB is. Um, and so some of the core uh, con uh, concepts here is the fact that it's immutable. Uh, immutable means it cannot be changed, right? So everything that takes place here is being recorded. In fact, the APIs themselves, we don't allow you the ability to modify or delete data that's in your journal. Um, the other thing is that um, it's cryptographically verifiable. So what that means is every transaction that is stored within the database has a mathematical hash associated to it, right? And so we'll talk a little bit more about how that works, but essentially what that means is that calculation, which is a SHA-256 um, algorithm, is something that you can digest and you can verify that not one thing has been modified. So you can, you can compare and contrast the, uh, the, the value that you received in the hash and, and know that even us, we have no ability to, to change that, right? And so that's, a, that's just how that works. And uh, it's highly scalable. So this is a serverless database. Uh, there's nothing from infrastructure that you need to worry about. And uh, because it's centralized, uh, there's no, again, there's no distributed ledger here uh, or different parties that are participating in the transactions. It is, uh, you know, it's, it's very um, scalable, right? It's highly scalable. And so you'll see that it performs much better than traditional blockchain frameworks, right? There's no additional uh, frameworks that you need to use. You're essentially using um, a SQL-like interface. Uh, it's a SQL on top of uh, this uh, database. And we'll talk a little bit about um, how it sort of varies from native SQL, but it's essentially SQL. Uh, but uh, you know, at a, at a high level, it's because you're writing SQL on a document store, and I'll, I'll kind of talk about that in a, in a bit. <clears throat> so at a high level here, let's kind of talk about what a ledger is, right? And so a ledger essentially has two main concepts. The first concept is a journal. And so what a journal is, is a journal is that complete history of every transaction block that occurred. And so the journal has everything that ever took place on this database. And each one of those blocks that you see is chained together, right? And so there's that cryptographic hash that takes place on every one of those um, uh, transactions. And they're, they're chained together, right? So they're all sort of uh, hash chained together. <clears throat> 
In addition to that, there are additional views that you have in the database, right? And so the, the views are a uh, current view. And so you can see what that last version of the document is. And then you also have a history view, which is very similar to like a summary if this was like a financial system. And you can see, you know, the individual changes that occurred in a particular document, right? So you have history, you have a current, and then you have that journal, right? And essentially, we'll kind of walk through the steps involved with what actually happens here. So imagine you have an insert statement, and that insert statement um, essentially finds its way as a transaction. It's, it's recorded in the journal. After it's recorded, it's propagated, it's reflected in the view of the current table as well as the history table. And um, maybe, you know, maybe uh, after that purchase that Tracy had, maybe she decided to sell her car to somebody else. So that's a new, uh, new transaction. A new transaction is recorded to the journal. Transaction one and two are hashed together, right? There's, it's cryptographically hashed and chained together. And then what we'll see is that the history table will now reflect the additional um, document that represents the history of the events. And then the current table will reflect the latest view of the data, right? So that's essentially uh, you know, what happens here. Um, there's nothing else that you need to do from, a, you know, from an audit standpoint or writing to different tables or doing things like that or managing um, any of these components. This is completely serverless, right? Now, let's sort of uh, kind of continue this uh, uh, scenario here. Let's imagine you deleted, maybe the car got wrecked, and uh, it's no longer part of this DMV database, this hypothetical database. So that's transaction number three. So in the current view, it's not applicable, right? There's no car, the car doesn't exist. The history table now could reflect that last uh, tombstone record, right? In this case, deleted. And one thing you'll also notice is that because this is a document, um, a document model, you're not tied to specific fields, right, or columns that might be associated to a table. So that's why you can, um, you can have like deleted or removed or something else as a, an actual transaction. And I'll get to that a, a little later. Now to contrast, right, so if we think about the traditional uh, database, Imagine you have two tables, maybe the history table is your audit table. Um, there's a number of ways that you might build this. I'll kind of just walk through one scenario. <clears throat> you wrote something, you inserted something to the current table, and then maybe you triggered uh, you know, a sort procedure. That sort procedure, again, is just writing that to the history table, and, and so on and so forth, right? And so you have that process that you, you sort of built. It's managed through that sort procedure. That history table is going to eventually grow to be incredibly large. Uh, it might be resource intensive. You might also have some logs that take place. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, you know, who has the ability to change those uh, those audit tables or that log. So the data itself is not cryptographically uh, uh, hashed or uh, you know, it doesn't have that capability. <clears throat> All right, so how does verifiability actually work? We'll kind of look at that a little deeper here. So assume you kind of you, you wrote uh, a transaction to QLDB. And the first thing that happens is we execute a SHA-256 function uh, on that value. So in this particular case, you end up with that, uh, that hash. This is, a, you know, this is a standard, we're using standard SHA-256, so you can, you know, if you had a 256 online tool or you, you probably have it running on your, uh, your, your Mac machines, you would get the same value. And then when the, uh, the second transaction comes in, what we end up doing is we don't just hash the second transaction, we chain the first one with the second one. Right, and so what that gives you is a sequence of the first plus the second, which, which uh, ensures that no changes on either one of these transactions has occurred as a chain, right? And then the same thing is true uh, for the third transaction, right? So this third transaction is also chained together um, as the previous ones. And so let's kind of look at the scenario where you know, this hypothetical scenario, and I mentioned earlier that 
we don't expose the, even the API to modify or delete from the journal. But if you wanted to kind of brainstorm this hypothetical scenario where in Tracy, let's say we change one character, which is her, uh, the I to the Y, what would happen here is that you would see that the entire uh, digest, which is the hash values, would be completely different, right? So that would indicate that a change took place. So one character would dramatically change the mathematical computation associated to that to the hash, right? And so that's why you can verify, you can trust, and you can verify, you can download those digests and verify that, in fact, nothing was uh, changed, right? And so if you want to learn more about SHA-256, I mean, this is a and it, uh, this is a, um, an algorithm that's, uh, you know, that is uh, published. And uh, there's a lot of content there on the internet. Uh, as I mentioned, your computer might actually have it installed. Um, and you can learn about how to run that algorithm yourself. And if you want to spend a, a good, good time reading up on it, it might take you uh, the majority of a day, but it's, uh, it's definitely a good read. Um, all right, and so if anybody needs any of those links, just grab me afterward. I'm happy to share any of that material with you. Now let's kind of talk a little bit about the models. Um, so if we, if we take a second and think about what a relational model is, right? So in a relational database, you essentially are architecting for, your, for normalization, right? So you're normalizing your, 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 your objects or your entities, and uh, your relationships are associated with joins, right? So this is a... a uh, you know, a, a typical relational database, right? And so, you know, over the years, we've seen, um, you know, a shift in terms of modern programming languages, documents, you know, objects, JSON, a lot of structures that nest um, objects together. And under the hood of QLDB is, is essentially a, a document store, a document model, right? And so we decided to make that, to choose that, um, that, that approach uh, because of, Know, the flexibility and also the uh, where modern programming languages are essentially headed, right? And so, if we were to kind of look at this one, you know, at a high level, um, you would see there is essentially a, an order object, and within that order object, you have these sub objects, right? This could be a shipping address, there could be an items object as well that exists within that uh, larger object. And if you were to look at them independently, um, you know, they, they might look like something like this, right? And so you have an order, an address, and order item. And so how does that impact SQL? Because I mentioned earlier that, you know, there's a SQL interface on top of QLDB. And so I'll kind of describe that. So if you were looking at a traditional SQL query, um, you might have something like this, where the orders, you might be doing a join with orders and the addresses on a shipping ID, right? And so you might have something that looks like that if you wanted to find all the orders uh, being shipped to Washington. For QLDB, the way that this changes, um, because you are not running a join somewhere else, you actually have objects nested within other objects, it's still SQL. The difference here, though, is you know, we're essentially exposing a dot notation. So you have orders dot shipping address, which is what that sub object was, if you remember from the previous slide, and then dot state, which was the property within the, uh, the shipping address object, right? And so because of that, you don't actually even need the, the additional filter to uh, uh, on the where clause to, to match on the IDs, right? And so it's a very simple, simplistic uh, SQL, and at a very, very high level, um, you're replacing your joins with the dot notation on the sub objects. So another uh, example, uh, just to make sure we cemented that uh, concept. So here's another uh, a join where you have orders with order uh, items. Um, and then again, you're filtering on the uh, uh, order ID uh, for both, uh, uh, for both uh, tables and the customer ID of that particular value. The way that that would convert, um, I'll just kind of speed up here. Basically, you're on one object, one document, which is the orders. And then all you really need to do is you don't need the where clause. So you don't need the, uh, the filter on ID. It's the same ID. And again, we're just filtering on the customer ID. Right, that's the only thing that we actually need uh, to reflect the same uh, SQL. All right, and so 
where does uh, Amazon QLDB make sense, right? So Amazon QLDB, just kind of recap here, is a, uh, is a, a, a database that makes sense when you need a complete and verifiable history of something, right? And so you also want to know and you want to ensure that you have that cryptographic um, capability that nothing has been changed, right? And so that's, uh, we, we, t we tend to see that with uh, verticals such as HR payroll, um, again, going back to some of the critical financial uh, systems that you might have and you, maybe you have controls and things that you need to reflect um, that data has not been altered. And in manufacturing, um, as well as uh, logistics, maybe it's the uh, entire process of inventory um, and showing where all the inventory checks have been made, where inventory was removed and added, by whom, by what date, and so you can clarify when uh, particular events took place. I mentioned, uh, you know, uh, tr uh, vehicle tracking. Uh, there could be, uh, if there's ever disputes of when a car was sold, when it was impounded, when it was this, when it was that. You have that complete history, uh, again, that was uh, unaltered, unaltered history. And then with healthcare as well, and there's a lot of sensitive you know, content that you need to make sure that data was uh, never altered. And so uh, you know, if any of that stuff makes sense, um, you know, please fill out the preview. Um, happy to uh, hang out afterward uh, as well if you have any questions. Um, just let me know. Uh, so uh, uh, this service currently is in preview mode, and uh, you can definitely fill that out. And you know, I'm sure we can work with you guys afterward uh, if you're interested to try it out. Thank you. <clears throat>